Now we're going to go over the trauma views for the cervical spine. So the routine trauma spine procedures that you would do uh, if you were in a trauma type situation would be the lateral cervical spine, lateral cervicothoracic spine, and these two you would do first and get those cleared, and then you would move on to your AP axial cervical spine and your AP axial oblique cervical spine, and depending upon uh, what your protocol is, where you're at, you may also have to do an AP open mouth projection. So starting first with our lateral cervical spine, like I said, we would perform this first, and then we would check with the physician before proceeding with other projections. This would be the same as the cross table one that we went over in the last video. Uh, we would do the patient in a dorsal decubitus position. Our shoulders would be relaxed. Our head would be without rotation, and we would ask the patient to look straight ahead without moving the head or the neck. If they have a collar on, we would not remove it. If the patient would happen to be cleared, and they said that the collar could come off, we would never still remove it. If the nurse wants to remove it, that is fine, or the physician can remove it. We can never, ever remove cervical collars off of a patient. Our image receptor is going to be placed again vertically at the top of the shoulder in a grid holder, and our central ray will be horizontal and centered to the midpoint of the image receptor, which would be about at C4. Our image, again, should demonstrate the entire cervical spine from the cella turcica to the top of T1. If all seven uh, cervical vertebrae are not seen, then a lateral projection of the cervicothoracic spine is required, which would be our swimmer's position. So this would be our, uh, this is also in another example of a lateral projection of the C-spine. As you can see, you can't see C7 here, but there is a dislocation of this actual cervical spine here. So that's kind of neat to see. And you would need to do a swimmers to make sure that you got C7 in case there was another injury below. You just have to be very careful with your patient. So this is an example of a case study here um, that a patient got a trauma series done. So a 47-year-old patient was presented to the emergency department in an ambulance after being involved in an MVA. The patient was experiencing neck pain and was referred for a trauma series, which included the cervical spine imaging. Uh, the lateral cervical spine image was achieved with passive lowering of the shoulders, and the image did not adequately demonstrate the cervicothoracic junction, and there is also an artifact from the cervical immobilization collar. So you can see how you can see a little bit of artifact in through here from the collar, and you can't see all of C7. So uh, the radiographer notified that the patient's asthenic body habitus might be well suited to both arms forward, lateral cervicothoracic junction technique. So the patient was asked to reach up with both hands and hold onto the wall bucky arm support. So like that thing you bring over for your lateral chest x-rays, you could have them hold on to that instead of having them, if they can't bring their arms down full, far enough, that way you can get them out of the way so you can see at least C7 through T1 through there. So then the humeral heads are projected clear of the cervical and thoracic vertebrae, which then results in good demonstration of the cervicothoracic region. So, but you can, know that despite the use of the digital radiography imaging technology, there is still overexposure of the cervical region resulting in partial oversaturation of the image just because of the patient's actual body habitus. And this little ring here is an artifact. They um, usually show up whenever a patient has one of those camisoles on with the plastic rings or a bra, which if they were in a true trauma situation, you wouldn't be able to remove that anyway, so you just put a note in the chart about that. So this would be our lateral uh, cervicothoracic spine, and this is how we would have to do it if the patient was on a backboard. You could do it on a table, or you can have them on the stretcher and put them up against the upright bucky, whichever is best in where, however your room is suited where you're at. This also has a cone filter on the end of this, which we can also use for cervicothoracic positions to make sure we have a more detailed image. Then we know this is required if C7 and the top of T1 are not demonstrated on the lateral C-spine. Um, trauma usually requires a dorsal decubitus position and the patient is supine without rotation. And you'd want to try to ask your patient to raise the arm opposite the x-ray tube over the head. And you can assist the patient and provide support if needed. This would be as you get as best as what you could if, with the patient condition depending upon what's going on with your patient. Again, we want to relax the shoulder, like we said, closest to the x-ray tube. Our, our vertical IR would be centered just above the jugular notch, and our horizontal uh, central ray would be centered to C7-T1 interspace and the mid-coronal plane. We would use a breathing technique, if possible, for these to make sure we can blur out the ribs and the lungs. Okay. If you couldn't uh, use a breathing technique, you could always have your patient hold their breath. 
So the image demonstrates, like we went over in the last video, uh, the lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebrae in profile between the shoulders. You can see it real good here. And you can also see it here. Okay. Moving on to our AP axial, sorry, AP axial cervical spine. Our patient is supine. Uh, they're usually immobilized with a collar and on a backboard or a spine board. And if they are, you want to place the image receptor under the backboard. Um, if it's present, and then we're going to center to C4, and we'll put our angle on, which is the 15 to 20 degree cephalad. We want the heads and head and shoulder without rotation, so we'll ask our patient to look straight ahead if we can. And we want to make sure that the head is not rotated. We could use a sponge um, if possible. And like we said, our central ray will be directed 15 to 20 degrees cephalad to enter our mid-sagittal plane and C4. Our image demonstrates C3 through T1. Sometimes we can see T2, and if the backboard is present, we may have some unavoidable artifacts that are seen. But you can see here, here's C3, and then it goes the whole way down to T2, T3, and part of T4. And this would be a trauma one here that was done, and you can see there is actually a dislocation in there. So it's actually a pretty cool looking pathology there. Now for our axial oblique cervical spines, we don't always do these in a trauma situation, but you may depending upon where you're at and if a patient has an injury that maybe they aren't able to see on the lateral and the APs. I, your patient would still be supine because they're usually immobilized with a collar and a backboard. In this one, you would also place the image receptor under the backboard and you would center it to C4 and the adjacent mastoid process and it would be approximately three inches lateral to the mid-sagittal plane. So this is how it would look like here. You'd have your image receptor underneath your patient, and then your actual central ray is going to have what's known as a double angle on it. So it's going to be 45 degrees lateral medially, and then you're going to also put another angle on it, which is 15 to 20 degrees cephalad, which I'll go over that with you in the lab, and you'll be able to understand it a little bit better. But our central ray is going to enter lateral to the mid-sagittal plane at the level of C4. And again, we want to make sure that we ask our patient to look straight ahead so their head's not rotated. And then our central ray um, is going to exit, should be in the center of our image receptor whenever we take this image. So our image is going to demonstrate the side opposite of our central ray, and it's going to look the same, pretty close to what we would get on an upright or a recumbent regular AP axial oblique that we do with the ankle. So you'll still be able to see your C1 through T1 or your T2 bodies and disc spaces. Your intervertebral foramina should be open. And again, if the backboard is present, you'll see unavoidable artifacts that might be seen. Now the image is going to look somewhat distorted, but it does provide valuable visualization of the cervical facet joints and intervertebral foramina, like you can see here in each foramen here. But as you if you would compare this to a regular AP axial oblique, it wouldn't look so distorted in through here. See how they look kind of elongated? You wouldn't see that on a normal one if you would do it erect or recumbent on the table without the double angle. So this is just a little review chart here that you can take a look at um, to help you study for your exam. It has each view on here, uh, the part position, central ray angle and direction, and best seen structures for each individual uh, projection here. And all of the actual views that we went over or projections that we went over in this in these videos will be on your competency, which we'll go over also in the lab. And these are all your technical factors for each uh, projection here. So you can see you have the SIDs here. Our KVPs are almost all 85. The only one that isn't would be our swimmer's position. And then our MASs are here for CR and here for digital. Again, they're about half for digital than what they are for CR. So we would start first with our atlas and our axis, and we have eight MAS for CR at 85 kvp, 40 inch SID, and our MAS is 3.6 for DR. For the dens, the fuchs, it's a little bit more because our patient, we have to go through the skull also. So 85 kvp, 40 inch SID again, 12.5 MAS, for CR and 7.1 for DR. Now for our AP axial cervical vertebrae, you're gonna cut it in half. So it's gonna be 6.3 for this one for our MAS. Our KVP again is still gonna be 85 and our SAD again at 40. 
and then for digital, it'll be 3.2. Now for the lateral position, we're taking our SAD to 72 inches, 85 kvp, again, 16 MAS for CR and 8 for DR. Now for hyperflexion and extension, we're just going to raise up our MAS just one step from our lateral because we're flexing and extending, so it will be 18 as opposed to 16, and then 7.1 for DR, and our SID for this one is also 72 inches. And again, 72 inches for our obliques. Okay, now our technique is going to increase for those because we have to go through a little bit more. So for our MAS for CR, we'll have 22, digital will be 10. And then our swimmer's position will have 96 kvp, 40 inch SID, 65 MAS for CR, and 28 for DR. Okay, so those are our techniques there. And I will also be uploading online a um, worksheet for you to do. And I will also have paper copies in class on Friday if um, you would like a paper copy instead. Okay, if you have any questions, please feel free to bring those to class with you on Friday.